Good morning. Today on Spotlight, we'll focus on two ambitious but very different efforts to move the state of Michigan and the city of Detroit forward. Our guest, Patrick O'Keefe, CEO of Grow Michigan, a partnership between Michigan's banking community and the Michigan Strategic Fund. And later, Don Bosey and Ann McGowan. They'll bring us up to speed on a big international robotics championship coming to Detroit for the very first time ever. It's Sunday, April the 15th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. 2012, Grow Michigan started. We're now up here in 2018. Uh, you just got an extension uh, with the state. Um, has it lived up to your expectations? I think so. We're uh, you know, relatively new to the party. We started managing the fund in 2017. So we were catching it at the tail end of the, the first draw. Um, but it has. We've created over 3,000 jobs in Michigan. We have invested $51 million, which has allowed business owners to leverage that up for an additional $250 million in business loans from the banks. So over $300 million came, uh, of capital came into transactions that normally wouldn't have. And, uh, and we've created jobs. So it's been a, a rousing success in terms of the fund. So Mr. O'Keefe, so the people uh, who are non-financial people really understand the role that Grow Michigan plays. You're sort of that middle man, so to speak, uh, in between the banks and others doing loans and stuff that they would normally not do for whether it's for regulation or it's just too risky for them? That's exactly right, Chuck, and I think that's a good analogy. If you look at uh, a bank, what they're typically going to loan you, they never loan you 100% of what you need. Mm -hmm. They give you 60 or 70%. So if you have a piece of equipment that you want to buy, you've got to come out of your pocket with the difference. And a lot of times business owners don't have the liquidity and the necessary cash to make that type of investment. Grow Michigan has the ability to provide those funds into the transaction that the banks can't uh, put in for their underwriting and regulatory basis and that the business owner doesn't have in his pocket to put forth. So we're there to really promote the business owner's opportunity for expansion. And the Michigan Strategic Fund plays a role in this in what sort of uh, that security factor backing up uh, and making people feel okay if something goes belly up here we're gonna cover you? So the Grow Michigan Fund was started by 19 banks and we have banks as large as PNC and Fifth Third, um, Flagstar, you know, in the, we also have some smaller banks mm -hmm. that are involved, Crestmark and Level One and that, but 19 banks were there. And it is riskier capital, right? It's capital that they wouldn't put out. So the State of Michigan Strategic Fund says, we're gonna backstop that with an investment of our own uh, to really cover up to 75% of any loss that you have on any one particular loan. So the banks had comfort knowing that one, they could pool their capital together and share risk. Two, they would have an investment vehicle that they normally wouldn't have because it wasn't really a loan that they were making, this was an investment into a fund. And three, that the state through the Michigan Strategic Fund would backstop any loss that they took. So it was a win for the banks because they get community reinvestment credit. It was a huge win for the state because they see jobs and tax base and capital that's coming into the market. And it was another victory for the business owner who typically doesn't have access to those funds, say under $5 million that would be available to them. So it was, it was a product designed to help smaller businesses. Right, and, and your major clientele are small businesses? So we have approximately 5,300 businesses in Michigan that would meet the parameters of being between three and 50 million in sales. So it's a big pool of companies and there's probably even more than that. Those are the 5,000 that we track and are on our radar screen. And so our goal is really to help small business have access to capital that they normally couldn't find. Well, quick question before we take a little break here. Um, how central is your interest in Michigan, by that I mean uh, whatever business it is, they have to prove to you that they're all about doing business in Michigan, staying in Michigan, and not trying to do some deal that next thing you know after they get this loan, uh, they're doing business in Indiana or Ohio or other places. That's exactly right. So the criteria that we have from an underwriting standpoint is to make sure that we're growing Michigan jobs, that our money stays in Michigan, 
in that the company's majority um, operation is in Michigan. So we're there as a resource for Michigan. Our money is not to be used out of state and it's not to be used to grow jobs in other communities. All right, we're gonna take a little break. When we come back, I wanna talk a little bit how um, the political arena fits into all this and how the global marketplace plays a role in all this. We'll be right back with Patrick O'Keefe, CEO of Grow Michigan. Stay with us. Mr. O'Keefe, uh, very quickly, the interest rate would be higher um, for the people that you do business with than what the bank rate would be most likely? It is. Our uh, rate is typically between 12 to 14 percent, so we're going to be almost double the cost that a bank would be. But as I tease my business owners every once in a while, sometimes the highest cost of funds is not having it. <laughs> and so our goal really is not to stay in the transactions for long periods of time, even though we can go up to five years. We have flexible terms, interest only, which many times the banks won't give you. And then we expect the senior lender that's in the transaction to ultimately take our capital out. Is Grow Michigan typical in most states or are we sort of an anomaly? This is a very innovative product that uh, Governor Snyder got behind and uh, only one other state that I'm aware of, I think Massachusetts has anything close to this. And uh, this is really a benefit to Michigan businesses. All right, so this was created in both a uh, private sector world but also a political arena. Uh, your extension is through 2019, so that gets you through the gubernatorial year. We see all the candidates out there. Um, might things change differently with a new legislature coming in? Possibly a new governor or possibly a different political party? It could. The, the beauty of our two-year extension is it does give uh, us the opportunity to show the uh, new governor how this fund works for a year and uh, we think that uh, there'll be an attraction uh, to it. The, the problem is I think many of the gubernatorial candidates really don't have a business background and probably are unaware of this, so we're also educating them as to you know, what we're doing because we think this is something the state could get behind. We've had some discussions with uh, Governor Snyder's group and if we can get this moving, they'd almost like to do a second fund, bigger. As you watch the various candidates, and I'm not gonna ask you who you're for or anything of that nature, because uh, that would be risky on your part, um, but what is it you and your colleagues are sort of listening for when they're making their pitches and they're talking to the people about what they want to do for the state of Michigan? You know what's interesting is that most business owners don't pay any attention to the stock market, especially closely uh, held businesses. They are dealing daily with the hand-to-hand -hand combat of being in business. Now companies that are international are obviously paying a lot of attention to this tariff issue in the stock market has responded um, initially negatively and I think our president has a decision to make whether this will be a tool for him to you know, bring back jobs in the United States or whether this is really going to be a long-term policy. So his choice will be whether he's a disruptor or a constructive disruptor. Yeah, yeah, but he does like to shake things up. Um, as you look at the stock market, do you think this is going to be overall when it's all said and done a good year for the stock market because it's certainly we've seen it do roller coaster here i do i think uh you know all the prognostication that has gone on on wall street has basically predicted the roller coaster ride over the first six months but i think uh you know pe ratios are really at their averages with the uh, change in the tax law companies should be more profitable on their bottom line should have more capital to invest and all those things bode well for the stock market all right you just wrapping up your tour of duty as president of the Detroit Athletic Club. Uh, what was that like? Well, it's a, it's a busy place. I mean, when you consider that the uh, athletic club sits at the forefront of the entertainment district, mm -hmm. it really is the heartbeat of Detroit when you look at its membership. I think uh, when I left there on February 2nd, we had 4,800 members. And, uh, you know, there are people- Membership growing? Oh off the charts. We have uh, almost a four or five year wait list now and people are plunking down half uh, of the initiation fee as a deposit for the privilege to wait four or five years to get in there. So it's, uh, as I tell people, it's a, it's a cruise ship on land and, uh, <laughs> and, and, you get like a, and you get a lot of access to people that normally you'd have a hard time getting access to. As president, it was wonderful because I felt, always felt I could pick up the phone and 
and have access to anybody because people always wondered what the, what the club was doing. Yeah, and not a bad spot to be able to look over into Comerica Park and see what's being played at any particular time. It, it's, it's beautiful there and I would tell you, uh, in my opinion, the, uh, the cigar bar on the other side of that seventh floor at night, there's no view more spectacular in looking at the city than that. All right, Patrick O'Keefe, thank you so much for coming in, sharing information about uh, Grove, Michigan, and we'll keep tabs on you. Chuck, thanks for your time today. All right, it's our pleasure. And coming up on Spotlight, an interview I did earlier this week with Don Bozy and Ann McGowan about an event that would generate millions of dollars and international attention on Detroit. We'll be right back. Good having both of you here. Good having you in Detroit. Of course, you're from our neck of the woods. Um, Don, let me start with you. In just a matter of days, something like 35,000 people will converge on downtown Detroit uh, for this first robotics international competition. Um, first time in Detroit? So this is our first time bringing the first world championship to Detroit. Uh, and as you said, we'll have probably in excess of 35,000 attendees. Uh, they'll come from 44 countries around the world. Uh, and we're very excited about it. Uh, I think it's a perfect place to host the first championship. Yeah, um, this is big and it seems like almost a natural and hard to believe that this is the first time coming to Detroit given the rich history that we have here with engineering, science, and math. So we've had a great uh, seven year run in the city of St. Louis and uh, Detroit seemed like a very logical next choice for us for, for many reasons. And this will host the championships for three years consecutively? That's correct. We're, we're here in Detroit for the next three years and possibly longer. So uh, we will have about 700 teams and they will draw from 25 states here in the United States and about 43 other countries around the world. So it'll be close to 15, 20,000 student participants. Uh, in addition, they'll have their mentors, coaches, teachers, parents with them. Uh, so it'll, it'll be quite a, quite a celebration. All right, I want to talk about the economic impact in just a little bit, but Ann McGowan, I want to get you in here. Um, you work over at Detroit Crystal Ray, uh, which I'm very familiar with, in Southwest Detroit. Um, Frank Venegas uh, uh, is very involved with that, great businessman in this town, and I know he's passionate about Crystal Ray and um, helping all the students there. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your involvement in this, um, both as a science teacher and as a robotics coach. So um, our, our team, the Kinematic Wolves, uh, started four years ago. Um, and we, when the school approached me, when Frank actually was the one who drove it, approached uh, me to consider starting the team, I did a little research in regards to the first organization and what they could bring in regards to helping uh, that exposure of the, the science and technology um, to, to allow for more opportunity for the students to explore mm -hmm. that hands-on approach and, and really uh, focus in on critical thought and problem solving. For the community, it's something that they don't get that opportunity very much. And so the more that we get out there and promote it, and we try to promote um, the, the first mission in the community as much as we can. Okay, uh, which brings me to a point, and Don, you see it from an international perspective, but um, we're hearing a lot about STEM these days, and that seems to be sort of all the rage in education and schools are being built around that curriculum to a great extent. Certainly we hear our governor uh, talk about it uh, based upon his past background and, and what his passion is. Um, but not all communities are able to get in on this, but you're trying to reach out to underserved communities, correct? You're right in the sense that uh, science, technology, engineering, and math are foundational for great career opportunities. And I, I would say almost any company, any business these days um, is some way technology enabled. And so uh, we, we see that this really opens up a world of education and career opportunities for kids. And it's, it's very obvious that oftentimes kids from, you know, higher income suburban schools have better access. Our passion is to figure out how do we make the, the game changing impact of FIRST programs available and accessible to all kids. Um, our founder always says we don't actually have an education crisis, we have a culture crisis. We have a culture that doesn't really celebrate kids' achievements in science and technology. And that's how our uh, program came about 
was trying to bring the same excitement and enthusiasm that kids have for sports or for music and apply that to something like science and technology where they can actually go pro and find jobs and create companies out there. All right, we need to take a little break. When we come back, um, I wanna pick up on the entire aspect of all of this, but I also wanna talk about the revenue impact that this is going to generate for the city of Detroit and how it ties into some of our major corporations here. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Uh, Don, revenue-wise, what does this mean for the city of Detroit to have a convention of this size? So we think having the uh, 35 to 40,000 attendees that we'll have here will have about $30 million a year of economic impact on the city of Detroit. Um, now, of course, that's near term. That's each year while the event's here. Right. Uh, but I would encourage people to think about what's maybe the long-term impact of bringing these young creative minds from all over the world to the city of Detroit. What kind of opportunities might that open for them to you know, accept you know, come to college here, maybe accept a job here, or maybe even start a business here in the city of Detroit. Uh, Governor Snyder has a computer background. Will he be involved in this in any way, shape, or form? He's one of our biggest cheerleaders, especially here in the state of Michigan, and so he's thrilled to welcome us here, and he will definitely be at the event. And when you look at this and you look at the opportunities for young people, uh, what comes to mind? I mean, we're hearing a whole lot about smart cars, particularly in this area where we have um, the major auto manufacturers and tons and tons of suppliers. Um, is that really sort of the way of the future? And when you're talking to these young people, are they as excited with that or other aspects of STEM? I think it's going to be the, depending on which student you talk to. Uh -huh. So uh, our, our team being broken up into three subcategories, mechanical, robot communications, and then a business side of things. The mechanical group would look at it in regards to the technology advancements that would have to happen to support the, the smart car movement um, in regards to the operational aspect of it. Uh, robot communications, that is going to be where our programmers are and the programming is already all over it uh, in regards to, they would love the opportunity to figure out, even just in, in the first robotics challenge, could they work it out where they could do the entire thing um, uh, autonomously, as in the entire challenge, really? where there wouldn't be a technological aspect to it. It would take a lot, but that's one of the things that they love, kind of like tweaking the code. And that's a goal that they're they shooting would for. They would love to be able to do something along those lines. Um, every year they get a little bit better in regards to just the, own, the one part of the program that already is autonomous. And so uh, with our team being so young, only four years, they're, they're completely self-taught. They do have a mentor that guides them, that helps them with, with the code. But it's something that they love testing that. And all they need is a mechanical group to give them the, the structure, and then they go out there and test it. So they, they, they enjoy working through those challenges, and they can see where the aspect of, of what they're doing within this program can help them in regards to their future opportunities. Don, uh, FIRST is headquartered in New Hampshire. Uh, you get to travel the world as the international president of all of this. We're always hearing, whether it's the politicians or it's the educators or it's the business community, talk about education and where is America. Where is America, especially in terms of STEM, compared to some of the other countries that you interact with? So the one thing I find interesting is every country sees its own unique challenges. Um, you know, maybe, and, and I would even argue uh, a lot of the comments about where America stands is based on standardized tests. and. I don't know that standardized tests necessarily translate into success in life. Mm -hmm. um, what I would say is, you know, the kids we see in first from all walks of life here in the United States um, are getting really excited about what science and technology can enable them to do and the types of opportunities that creates. But we see similar issues, you know, China, for example, everybody's afraid. I mean, they're, they're a country that certainly celebrates science and technology. Right but they get a lot of criticism for their education system maybe being a little bit more memorization based and maybe not as creative. And so they're looking at programs like FIRST and in terms of how do they bring create creativity into the education process? How do they bring more innovation into the education process? So 
I think um, in, in Israel, we have over a thousand first teams in, in the country of Israel, which is about the size of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, and they see it as a way to actually bring, bring people together. We have Palestinian teams, we have Jewish teams, we have Bedouin teams. So they use it actually to sort of help knit a social fabric uh, within the country. So uh, we find every country has some really unique challenges and uh, in some way, shape or form, they, they find these programs to be interesting ways to help address them. Uh-huh, Amigal, uh, what will be the biggest takeaway for this uh, convention as it relates to you and what you're trying to do with young people on an individual basis and a group basis? So uh, as, as an educational standpoint, it is just the exposure. It's uh, getting more and more people to, to see the, the, the joy that comes from the, this, uh, this avenue of science and technology. Um, that, that there is more to it than, than, than uh, building the robot. Um, I know that's one of the mottos, um, but, uh, but it is that joy, that excitement, that, that thrill of the, of the chase, that uh, we see it more and it's promoted more within the sports community. And, and this really is truly the sport of the mind. Our students absolutely enjoy it to the nth degree. When we're at a competition, they don't want to leave. This is very visual. <laughs> I, I, it, yeah. I mean, to draw the analogy to sports, which is very visual, mm -hmm. this is very visual and it something is. that can really excite students if they get exposed to it. Right? Yes. Dom, you get the final word. Uh, if there's a message out there to Detroiters uh, who may or may not be into STEM with right. this competition coming, what would the message be? So, uh, well, two things. One, uh, you mentioned it, it's visual. So come on down, come check it out. It's free and open to the public uh, okay. at the Kobo Center from April 25th through the 28th. Uh, if you have kids, bring them. I assure you they will get excited about it. Um, and uh, to Ann's point, we really, while we use robotics as a way to get kids engaged, it's really more about b using robotics to build the kids rather than using the kids to build robots. So. Um, the types of, of learning experiences that the kids get out of this, even the networks they, they create. Um, and, and it takes a village. So it's, it's not just the students and the teachers, but also corporate corporations that get involved and help mentor and support these teams that are really critical. So we encourage everybody to come, come down and get involved. I said that was last question. We'll sneak one other right. little one in there real quick. Uh, Larry Alexander and his staff over at the Detroit Convention and Visitors Bureau. Have they rolled out the red carpet for this? They've, I don't, I've never seen a redder carpet in my life. Uh, <laughs> Detroit is incredibly welcoming. Yeah. And as you yeah. said, it's all the way from the governor to the Convention and Visitors Bureau to the community. Uh, but they've done a fantastic job and uh, they're, they're helping us make sure that everybody in Detroit and everybody in Michigan knows about this and uh, wants to come down and check it out. So. All right, thank you for coming over. Uh, thank you for flying into town to, to do this interview along with other meetings and stuff that you have to do before you have to catch a plane and uh, fly back out. And we'll see you back here in a few days. Sounds good. All My right, pleasure. thank you. Emma Gowan, thank you for joining us and uh, best of luck to you over at Crystal Ray and all the other things that you're doing. Thank you. All right. And tell Frank Benegas I said that. <laughs> Will do. All right. Special thanks to all of my guests today. I'm Chuck Stokes. And we'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the spotlight. We hope you have a great week.